So, is the quantum realm different? No. No different. Only different in your mind. You must unlearn what you have learned. Materialism was the view of many scientists at the turn of the 20th century. This simplistic view that all that existed was matter and energy, and the rearrangements of it, is the extreme view of realism. Realism is a general belief accepted by many today, that a physical reality exists independent of observation. And roughly 100 years ago, most held to one of these two views, rejecting the opposing view, idealism, the view that reality is a mental construct and doesn't exist independent of observation. For many back then, their understanding of physics seemed to favor this side of the spectrum, firmly believing it buried idealism. However, this realistic worldview was shaken with the advent of quantum mechanics. The realization of how the quantum world behaved began to eat away at the materialist and realist beliefs. Matter was thought to be tiny particles that existed independent of our observation. However, the equations of quantum mechanics and the results of the double slit experiment changed that. To understand what this experiment showed, a simple explanation is given. Subatomic particles were thought to exist like tiny bits of matter, not like continuous waves of energy. However, sending electrons through a double slit showed they acted like waves of energy instead of tiny bits of matter. Even sending one electron through at a time, the same results happened. However, when one set up a measuring device at one slit, the results changed, and the electrons acted as one would expect, as tiny bits and not spread out waves. I personally find that I gravitate more towards the information theoretic point of view and, and believing that uh, that I'm, I, the universe that I exist in is a very good, high-quality simulation. So recently someone sent me a link to this video called Quantum Physics Debunks Materialism and wanted to know my take on it. This video was put out about five years ago on a channel called Inspired Philosophy, and it has like 600,000 views at this point. And this channel is by a guy who claims to be a Christian and uh, who is thoroughly engrossed in trying to reconcile the Bible with modern science in a number of ways, which we shall get into. But that section at the beginning talking about idealism versus realism is the beginning of that uh, video. And overall, I think what he's laying out here is actually very helpful in understanding fundamentally why this is a, a false argument and a false construct and essentially a, a Hegelian uh, type of false logic, false dichotomy. So the bulk of the video, he's just talking about the double slit experiment and then all the subsequent alleged discoveries and proofs uh, that science has done over the decades, talking about all the same stuff with wave particle duality and how the observer actually changes the effect of the experiment and blah 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 blah. The same stuff you hear every time when you look into this topic. And so by the end he's talking about Schrodinger's cat and then playing some some clips from a sci-fi channel program talking about quantum physics and then he kind of reveals his uh, overall conclusion supposedly making an argument that uh, quantum physics and idealism simulation theory are really consistent with a theistic worldview. So this is about three and a half minutes. I'm just going to play this part at the end. Schrodinger's cat was supposed to show that nothing in this universe is certain until someone makes a measurement. But another pioneer of quantum mechanics, Eugene Wigner, believed it could teach us something else about the working of the universe. That consciousness controls everything. Wigner said, let's take it one step farther. If I, a human being, looks at the cat, I am conscious. Therefore, consciousness determines existence. At that point, Einstein went ballistic and said, what? You're saying that the fact that you are a conscious being determines the fact that the cat is alive? The answer is yes. And Wigner made one more step. And that is, how do I know I'm alive? You see, the cat and me, we're part of the same universe. If I don't know the cat is alive or dead, I could also be dead at the same time and not even know it. So who determines that I'm alive? Well, 
Bigner's friend looks at me, I look at the cat, and we exist. But then who looks at Bigner's friend? And there's an infinite chain of people looking at people, looking at people, until finally you hit cosmic consciousness. Some consciousness that's ethereal, that envelops the universe, which looks at us and says, aha, the cat is alive. I would even go as far to say that this position is more logical than the solipsist position. Because in this case, one can point out that our mind doesn't create reality, it only participates in it. In other words, we are not the architect, or have the ability to change the structure of the world through mental processes. Remember the scenario set up in the quantum enigma about opening the box. If we decide to look in one box and find where the atom is, we do not actually decide where it will end up. We just use our free will to participate in deciding what the outcome will be, whether a wave or a particle result. But we don't get to choose the specifics. So the evidence suggests we are just lesser minds dependent on a much larger one that is actually in control of the structure of the experience, and we are allowed to operate and be able to participate in the outcome of the idealist experience. Now one objection to the theistic perspective is raised in the quantum enigma. If God is observing the physical world and us in it, then how come we can do experiments showing something unobserved is in a superposition? In other words, if God is looking down at everything, the strange rules of quantum mechanics should never have been verified, since they are always being observed by God. Well, this is a misunderstanding. God is not separate from us, someplace in space observing us, as space and matter are illusions of our conscious observation, as the falsification of realism shows. The existence of the physical world is created by our observation of it, and it doesn't exist other than that. So what is there for God to observe other than what we see? Consciousness is what is fundamental, and our consciousness would be dependent on a larger one. God is in a sense observing us having an experience of the physical world. And apart from our experience, there is nothing that needs to be observed as it exists in the state of a wave function. So he is not separate from us as our consciousness is dependent on his, and he doesn't need to see an independent experience of the physical world. So thus we can conclude no other. Given the scientific evidence that has led us this far, what other inference does this lead to? Of course, one can always refuse to go with us to the logical conclusion, but that does not refute the conclusion or change it. Science has not buried God, it has revealed him, and with it buried materialism. It remains now only in the fantasy of materialism. So hopefully the errors that's inherent in his conclusion is apparent to most of you, although the scary thing is, is that we see more and more people becoming sympathetic to these kinds of ideas, such as Doug Hamp, which I shared recently, and many others as well, and I'm going to touch on another example in a minute. But if you have any familiarity with Hermeticism, specifically the law of mentalism, you should be able to see that this is precisely what is being echoed by this inspired philosophy guy. The only difference is that he's trying to avoid the conclusion that what he's saying is, is complete pantheism by modifying the overall teaching ever so slightly as to say that, well, we don't actually create the world ourselves, as a lot of the New Age straight-up quantum mystics would say, where we're all creators and we're all God. You know, a quantum theist, I guess we could say, would try and deny that and say that, no, no, it's only participatory. We're not actually creating it, but we're participating in this idealistic reality, you know, whatever that means. And God is still somehow not on the same level as us, or not just the amalgamation of our collective consciousness. That somehow he has his own consciousness, and he's just viewing the world through our eyes, basically, which is just, really, it's panentheism rather than pantheism. So if you're familiar with those two terms, you understand that they're really just the same thing, just in a Again, a slightly modified version to make it seem more compatible with theism and with biblical Christianity. And in reality, it's honestly no different than theistic evolutionists who try and argue that evolution is not incompatible with the Bible and that God created the world through evolution, which ironically, this inspired philosophy guy <laughs> actually believes as well. So surprise, surprise. Nothing really shocking there. But what I, I admit is kind of surprising to me is something else someone shared with me recently concerning a video that was just recently put out by a channel called The Fuel Project, which I would imagine many of you are familiar with. I know I came across The Fuel Project you know, years ago when I was first learning about conspiracy and Bible prophecy and everything. I, when I remember watching this series that this guy Mark Fairley put together called Know Your Enemy, 
That's a really fantastic uh, series. There's so many videos in here talking about all these different topics and kind of threading them together in a way that really helps kind of fill in a lot of pieces for you when you're first being exposed to the New World Order and how the conspiracy has progressed through so many different things, whether it's the UN or the New Age Movement or Bohemian Grove and going all the way back into ancient times and covers a lot of ground. It's really great. It's a really great series. So he has this channel called The Fuel Project, and he's been doing lots of videos about God and the truth of the Bible. And, and honestly, I hadn't really watched anything he'd done in several years, but he just came out with his video talking about the rise of simulation theory. And so he's introducing his viewers to, you know, what simulation theory is, and he plays clips from Elon Musk talking about it. He actually calls Elon Musk a luminary. It's like, are you serious? And then proceeds to play this clip from one that I've shown before of Neil deGrasse Tyson talking to Larry King about simulation theory, and then responds to Neil deGrasse Tyson by concluding with this. The idea that we're living within a created universe and that the laws of physics have been programmed in by a creator outside of that universe is of course something the Bible has been saying for thousands and thousands of years. So it's really interesting that secular scientists are now starting to turn in that direction. Of course what's silly from the secular position is that they're still not willing to invoke God as the creator. I mean think about this for a second. Hey Neil deGrasse Tyson, this universe was created by Almighty God. Pfft, what? No, that's silly. Hey. Neil deGrasse Tyson, this universe was created by a 10 year old kid in his parents' basement. Ah oh, yeah, that could, that could definitely be true. It's hard to argue against that. God, kid, God, kid. Hmm. This is intelligent design by any other name. And what's also really interesting is that many scientists are so excited about this idea of simulation because it gives them a welcome escape from having to defend the implausible claims of Darwinian evolution. Dr. Rich Terrell is a NASA scientist who says that we might be living in a simulation is a simpler explanation for our existence than the idea that we are the first generation to rise up from a primordial ooze and evolve into molecules, biology, and eventually intelligence and self-awareness. In other words, the whole evolution thing seems a bit far-fetched. It looks like we're living in some kind of designed reality. That seems to be the case here. Terrell even says that a designed world would help us to explain some unresolved problems in quantum mechanics. So they're getting so close to the truth here. They're getting so, so close. Of course, again, the Bible has been saying it all along that this universe has a designer, has a creator, if you want to put it in these terms, even a programmer, and that there's a larger reality outside of this universe. The only problem is that they're so blinded by their internal resistance to God and they're so keen to not be morally constrained by what God's existence would mean that they'd rather put the creation down to a 10 year old kid on a computer in his parents' basement than God himself. That seems more plausible to them, or at least less troubling to their conscience is perhaps nearest to the truth. So once again, we see an example of Christians trying to claim that, oh look, science is just catching up with what God said all along. When in fact, no, the Bible does not teach this at all, but this is just straight out of hermeticism and mysticism. And the thing is, I really don't believe that Mark Fairley is knowingly teaching something false or that he even fully comprehends the implications of the theories that he is proposing. And that's what is so frustrating and, and so frightening about this is that, as we heard him say, his perception of simulation theory is that it's just really just another word for intelligent design. And I think a lot of people kind of share that assumption and this is really crucial to, for people to understand that, that simulation theory is about so much more than just, oh, it's, it's just another way of saying intelligent design. Obviously, if it's a simulation, then it's designed by an intelligence, and so that much may be true, but the implications go far beyond. And while he correctly points out the absurdity of Neil deGrasse Tyson scoffing at an almighty god, but then turning around and ascribing the, the simulation to a 10-year-old child, yeah, it is kind of ridiculous. But what Fairley doesn't seem to grasp is that even while he's quoting from a guy named Nick Bostrom, who's one of the prominent mainstream progenitors of simulation theory, Bostrom is constantly talking about this concept of the nested simulations. And Elon Musk as well, when he talks about the alleged greatest arguments for simulation theory, is just 
Basically, they, it boils down to that there's this tiny probability that we are in base reality, like one in billions probability. So for Christians to argue that we're in a simulation and that God must just be the programmer, they're completely missing the fact that inherent to simulation theory is the assumption that the reality outside of our reality is not base reality either. So in a sense, thinking of God as the programmer, he himself in turn would just be regarded as yet another simulation of a reality outside of that, which in turn is a simulation of, re of a reality outside of that. And boom, now you're talking about the whole fractal universe concept. And it's just, again, straight back to the new age. So if we go back to the spectrum of beliefs put forward by the Inspired Philosophy Channel, we see that it's pitting materialism against idealism. And this is where I, this is the false dichotomy. This is the false choice that has to be understood so as not to fall into this faulty reasoning. Because while on the one hand, yes, as Christians, we reject scientific materialism. We do not believe that everything is just matter and energy and that's all there is. But the alternative to that is not to just dive into the concept of idealism or mentalism or that everything is just a dream, a mental construct but rather a solid biblical understanding of the world recognizes that there is a real world, a real physical world that exists independent of our observation, and that there is a spiritual world that is also real, but operates under different laws and mechanics, which by and large are a complete mystery to us. And the two of these things are, are interfaced in a number of ways in the creation, first and foremost, in our own selves. And yes, while we can... We can dream dreams and we can imagine things that don't actually exist in reality. That doesn't mean that the things that you experience while dreaming are just as every bit as real as what's going around you when you're asleep. And honestly, it seems insane to even having to be like refuting ideas like this when all, all you have to do is open up Genesis 1 and think about the fact that when God created the world, when God created the heavens and the earth, it existed independent of any of, any of us human observers for the first five days of creation. And then you turn to the book of Job, when God is rebuking Job and his companions, he says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where were you when I made all this? And he's scoffing at our human presumption, and again and again, making the point that, you know, I was there. I was the only one there. It exists because of me, regardless of whether you, you saw it or experienced it or observed it. God does not need our observation. This whole participatory universe thing is just a repackaging of pantheism and panentheism. It's no different than tacking God onto the Big Bang. You're just tacking God onto Hermeticism and trying to Christianize it. Whether people realize they're doing that or not, What if part of your subconscious is still connected to the original consciousness that programmed this virtual reality? After all, we know that our subconscious can create a physical experience for us while we sleep. Genuine inspiration, right? Now in a dream, our mind continuously does this. We create and perceive our world simultaneously, and our mind does this so well that we don't even know what's happening. That's good. You've taken your first step into a larger world. From the inception of the wireless system, I saw that this new art of applied electricity would be of greater benefit to the human race than any other scientific discovery, for it virtually eliminates distance. The majority of the ills from which humanity suffers are due to the immense extent of the terrestrial globe and the inability of individuals and nations to come into close contact. Wireless will achieve a closer contact through transmission of intelligence, transport of our bodies, and materials and conveyance of energy. When wireless is perfectly applied, the whole earth will be converted into a huge brain, which in fact it is. All things being particles of a real and rhythmic whole, we shall be able to communicate with one another instantly, irrespective of distance. Not only this, but through television and telephony, we shall see and hear one another as perfectly as though we were face to face, despite intervening distances.